<laughs> okay. <clears throat> Call the meeting to order at 10 o'clock. Uh, before we start, I want to point out a couple of things to you all. Number one, I am not Sam Hall. Uh, Sam is on a timeout, so it's a little tough to, he will be on, on Zoom, but it's a little tough to run one of these meetings remotely, so I will be running the meeting today. For those of you on YouTube who will be seeing this, uh, I am Bob Hankey, I'm the Vice Chair. Secondly, I'd like you all to look at your picture on the screen and adjust your camera until your face is in it so we can see you. Uh, I will be taking your, your hands and your motions and things like this off this screen, and if all I can see is the top of your head or the, the you know, ceiling around you or your coffee cup on the table, I can't really see your hand very well, so line yourself up. Okay. Uh, Ms. Clary. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, and Sam, glad to see you there. Um, dear Father, we thank you for a spectacular fall, and today we thank you for the rain. Nature provides solace to us all. Please continue to guide and support our families and keep them safe. They are experiencing living a very different life. Help our communities to continue to look out for each other and show compassion and kindness. And we give great gratitude to all the department heads and our leaders who have led us well through the COVID-19 pandemic. Please continue to guide. Amen. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. In case of fire or other emergencies, there's three exits to this room, there, there, and there. In case of this emergency, please proceed to an exit. Here's the exit. Find the nearest stairway, go down the stairway. Clear the buildings and go as far away from the buildings so emergency squad, rescue squads can do their job. Please silence your cell phones for this meeting. Thank you. A roll call, please. Mr. Hankey. I am here. Mr. Spedler. She's waving her hand. She's waving her hand. Mr. Ferguson. Mr. Shaw. Here. Mr. Hall. Here. Mr. Losaw. Here. Mr. Hicks? Here. Mr. Ward? Here. Mr. O'Brien? Here. Mr. Half? Here. Mr. Campbell? Here. Mr. Skelly? Here. Mr. Hogan? Here. Mr. Wilson? Here. Mrs. Clary? Here. Mr. Griffith? Here. Mr. Rosell? Here. Okay, we have... Uh, this first order of business, two presentations. The first one, uh, I'll have Mr. O'Brien introduce him. So, as we know, that uh, the Broadband for All program, Split Networks is one of the ones that we've awarded uh, several towns in Washington County and hundreds, if not thousands, of prospective customers to serve it out. And I thought it'd be nice if Kevin would, would stop and give us a, a, a join us and give us an update on where they're at. I am disappointed Mr. Ferguson isn't here to hear the updates because uh, he's certainly involved in this and he's one of the ones they're looking for. So, Kevin? Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you for inviting me for this update. Uh, just a quick background I'm with Slick Network Solutions. Uh, we are uh, an outgrowth of the Nickelville Telephone Company, which was founded in 1902 in Nickelville, New York. Uh, just north of the Adirondack Mountains. So um, we know the, the, uh, the North Country well, it's where we've grown up. Um, I wanna give you a little background on the current grant program and where we are in the timeline and uh, hopefully provide some uh, explanations as to what the process looks like, what's involved with it, and then where we are today and, and, and how we get this thing done. So, um, I think you're all aware, New York State had a three rounds of the uh, broadband grant program. We were awarded a significant portion of territory in Washington County, along with other territories in Warren, Clinton, Essex, Franklin, St. Lawrence counties. Um, that award was announced in February of 2018. Um, we, over the course of the next year, 
worked with the state to come up with what's called a grant distribution agreement. Uh, that was signed in March of 2019. So it took quite a while from the time that the grants are actually uh, announced to uh, we actually had awards that we could take action on. Um, in March of 2019, we uh, contracted with um, companies that will do what's called the make ready design. So most of our facilities are located either on national grid or uh, NYSEG poles. That's how we build out our networks. And in that process, we have to get permission to attach our facilities to their poles. Um, they require us to use one of their contractors. And uh, traditionally in a uh, business as usual environment, it, it takes 90 days from the time you apply to the time that you get access to the pole. Um, however, because of the large amount of broadband activity across the state, as well as I think some of you are aware of the charter mandate for them to build out to several hundred thousand additional homes, put a lot of stress on the system. So even though we applied as early as March 2019 for these polls, uh, we have a few applications that are still yet to be um, finalized. That process has taken a very long time. Um, what that looks like, just to give you some um, sense of that, is every pole that we want to attach to has to be photographed and then engineered. So uh, a photograph is taken, they determine the height of the existing lines on that, and then they have to engineer to decide whether our fiber optic utilities can be mounted up high enough to provide appropriate ground clearance while leaving enough space for the power sector to keep our, uh, our workers safe. Um, we have to be a certain distance away from power um, when we attach to those poles. Um, for this project in Washington County, I believe there's over 20,000 poles, just to give you the scale that we're attaching to. Um, and those are done in batches of 125 poles uh, to the different pole owners. Um, where we are right now, we have about 50% of those packages that are in what's called make ready construction. So we're doing the necessary uh, changes. Uh, for Washington County, uh, it's replacing uh, at least 500 poles throughout the county with newer poles, as well as doing other work, such as moving transformers, moving the uh, feeder lines to the homes and things like that. So it's a, it's a pretty involved process. Um, once those poles are made ready is the term we use, they're, they're uh, safe for us to attach. We then have a contractor go through, we attach a steel cable, and then we lash our fiber optic to that cable. And that's kind of how we build out that network. Um, as of right now, um, we have a fair amount of construction going on in the town of Putnam, pushing down in the town of Dresden. Uh, just Monday of this week, I was down in Dresden and I was in Whitehall uh, reviewing with National Grid some of the work. Um, one of the things we have to be careful for, as you imagine, um, this work can be quite costly. A, a pole can range anywhere from six to $20,000 to replace. So it's really important that we know that we actually have to replace that pole and that there's not an alternative. Um, again, with the pandemic and with a massive amount of work, um, not all of the designers who are doing this work are actually out in the field. So it's oftentimes a pole will be called for replacement. We'll get out in the field and we'll find out that it doesn't really need to be replaced because the, the conditions in the field dictate otherwise. So there's a, a bit of work involved with that. Um, I was down in Hampton as well. and. Uh, a little bit into Hartford. Uh, next week, I will be down in uh, Jackson, Easton, uh, Hebron. Uh, where else do I need to head down there? Uh, we've got a little bit in Shattagoke, but I think that might be in Rensselaer County. Who did I miss? Granville. Granville, sorry. And Miss Clary, where are you at? Clary. Salem. Salem, okay. So all those places are where we're coming. Um, not all of those ones I necessarily need to go inspect. Some of those we came through and the make ready was appropriate, so we approved it. Um, but for example, there's some spots in Easton I need to look at. And a lot of this, as you are all well aware, the electrical infrastructure is quite old in parts of the county, uh, which means the poles tend to be shorter and further apart, which does add some challenges. Um, also, one of the things that I look for is I want to make sure that uh, the broadband program is not uh, paying for poles that should have been replaced uh, due to pre-existing conditions. Uh, you know, so if I get to a pole and the pole is completely rotted out, that's a pole owner responsibility. The broadband program should not be paying to replace that pole. That should be done in the normal course of maintenance for the pole owners. Um, so there's a lot of work there. Um, 
where we are now, we, um, you know, our, our goal is to have all this project done by the end of the year, and we are pushing hard to do that. We have multiple crews working on the make ready. Uh, we have multiple construction crews out there. We're also doing a fair amount of buried work. Um, so again, in the uh, town of Whitehall, we're burying a couple miles along County Route 18. Um, we've got some buried work down in Easton and in Jackson. And doing that, we can try and um, make the uh, reduce the cost by reducing how far we have to run to get to these different locations. Um, I don't know if I have the ability to um, share my screen, but I did uh, send some maps to uh, Dave O'Brien, and I don't know if, if you saw that in your email, Dave, a PDF that you could share. It's a kind of a high level overview of the county and where we're going. Um, just a couple of things I want to mention, then I'd be glad to take any kind of questions. Um, as we engineered the route, there are several locations where we are running fiber through locations that were not grant awarded, um, but we need to get from group A to group B. We will, to the extent possible, we will be serving all those locations along that route. Um, in some example, some sections we might not, for example, in downtown Whitehall, we may be limited because there's so much infrastructure there, it's very difficult to build. But in any of the rural areas, if we have cable along that route, we will be serving people who are adjacent to that. Um, the typically we include 300 feet from the last utility pole is covered anything beyond 300 feet there is a contribution needed by the subscriber um and we try and you know work with folks on that um <clears throat> beyond that our our base service will start at 60 dollars a month for a 25 meg by 25 meg service uh, one of the things i'll mention being all fiber all of our services are symmetrical so the upload and the download are the same which is really helpful for things like Zoom and other cloud-based applications. Um, for residential, we can go up to 100 meg. For businesses, we can do gigabit service and we can also do custom plans if needed. Um, and, uh, oh, I will mention too, and I do mention this to the various um, town supervisors and school superintendents. If in the footprint that we're serving, there are students who have um, free or reduced lunch and they request, we do have some data packages at a reduced rate for those individuals to try and get them connected. Um, also for seniors on uh, this, you know, uh, SSDI, you know, we do have a reduced rate for that as well. So we do try to work and understand that there are circumstances where $60 may be a barrier for some people. Um, a lot of times people find though that they can you know, maybe use other services and reduce that. So if they're paying for Dish TV, for example, once they have fiber, maybe they don't need both those subscriptions and they can save some money that way. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we, we recognize how incredibly important uh, broadband is. And so we're trying to get it out to everyone. And if there are areas where we're not covering and we can partner with other companies or we can do creative solutions, um, we're very open to that. In St. Lawrence County, we have done some what we call neighbor to neighbor networks where we put a wireless repeater on a silo and we were able to get a student who otherwise wouldn't have access, uh, internet access, so he could use his Chromebook for school. So we've done that in probably a half a dozen locations. So we try to be as flexible as we can. Um, being a small company, we have a lot more flexibility on creative solutions than, than others might. Um, hey, Kevin? Yes. You can share your screen. Oh, okay, great. Let me let me pull up. Um, this is gonna be a very colorful map here, and I'll probably need to resize my screen a little bit. And um, so, what I want to show you here, this is just kind of a basic overview of our network. So we start in Ticonderoga. Uh, we've partnered with Crown Point Telecom, and they're providing us some access back up further to uh, Elizabethtown, where we have other network. And then we come down through Putnam, Dresden. We hit quite a bit of each of these uh, townships. Come through Whitehall. I don't believe we service any grant areas in Whitehall, but we will be building up County Route 18 up into Hampton. And then we come down here. Um, Granville, there's a few areas in the, it looks like the western part of Granville, um, out towards Fort Ann, we service. And then we come down. Almost the entire township of Hebron is covered by Slick. I don't think there's any area that's not covered by us. Um, if there is, please let me know and we can see what we can do. Um, and then we continue down through Argyle, out towards, I believe that's Fort Edward. We come down through Salem, 
um, quite a bit of network here. And then we kind of hopscotch across and down into Easton uh, through Greenwich or Greenwich. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I apologize. Um, and, and this map is showing just the various states. This is as of um, a week and a half ago. So yellow and orange are in make ready construction. Some of these purple areas, we're still waiting for the final packages back from NYSEG. We, we have gotten a few of these in the interim since the, the map needs to be updated since uh, a week and a half ago. Um, some of these red areas, we're still working with a national grid contractor on getting those finalized. And uh, so we can get those into construction. Um, and I know I've done a lot of talking, so I would uh, love to open it up to questions. Campbell. What was the purple on that map? Purple are where we have approved the design and we're waiting for NYSEG to give us a, a, what's called a make ready package. So the make ready package details all of the work that our contractor needs to perform. And NYSEG does it slightly different than National Grid. Uh, NYSEG, we hired the contractor to do both the billable work, the work that we're responsible for, plus the non-billable work. So as I mentioned, oftentimes there's pre-existing conditions where the poles need to be replaced or other things that have do more to maintenance issues than the fact that we're coming in. So on the uh, Nash, on the oven grid side, nice egg side, we hire the contractor to do all that work and then they reimburse us their portion of it. Um, on the national grid side, national grid does their own work in house and then our contractors do the work that's caused by our presence there. Um, and then I'll just remind everybody, as with most state grants, this is a reimbursement program. So we don't get the money till we spend the money, provide the, and that's about a, anywhere from a, a, a three to six months between the time that we spend the money and the time that we're reimbursed from the state for that, their portion of it. Right. Okay, Kevin, Brennan Campbell, uh, Supervisor for Hebron. Okay, Hebron. Right. Um, Anyway, as you know, you're pretty much the, the one-man show there in Hebron. We do have limited coverage from Vitel Wireless and Hudson Valley Wireless that have proven to be somewhat uh, very reliable in certain areas. Uh, but everyone there is waiting for fiber optic line. Is there any update on when we can expect the first service to arrive and actual completion? I mean, that's what they're all worried yeah. about. Um, I'm hoping to have, you know, initial service provided uh, by the end of the year, but, but obviously with the number of, of folks that we're serving, we, we are going to have a backlog. Um, so I will tell you, we have hired, um, at this point, we have one contractor that's got four additional install crews. I am talking to another company out of um, the Plattsburgh region to look to get some additional crews. So we are going to bring on... Um, a bunch of additional contractors during this initial phase to try and get as many people installed as we can. Um, because if we, if we did it with their in-house crews, obviously we, we, we couldn't keep up with the demand. Um, we also don't want to necessarily hire everybody in-house because once we get over that initial surge, it comes more to, to maintaining. Um, so we are looking to bring in additional contractors. Um, we ask and we do provide all of our contractors with uh, slick badges and slick, um, uh, magnets for their trucks so that you'll know they're associated with us, even though they may have other names on their vehicles. Um, and I can provide you info on that. Um, the, the other piece I'll mention is what we will do as a, a section becomes available for install, we will send postcards and we pull those addresses from the tax records. Um, so hopefully that catches anybody who's seasonal or anything like that. Um, it's not 100% uh, foolproof, but hopefully enough neighbors get it and they can spread the word. Um, and we also will explore doing um, uh, a door tags. And that's something where, again, if we could, um, you know, it's a, a great opportunity for a, a local high school college kid to go around and tag doors and we can um, have them help us do that to get the word out. Can you reach out to supervisors too? When Absolutely. To yeah, because that's, uh, since it's not everybody's mind, they're dying to hear from us. So if we can get that word out, they'll be looking for you. Well, what would be great is if um, I could get a, a list of all the supervisors' email addresses, and I'll create a a, a mailing group, and I can send you guys period send you all periodic updates. Dave O'Brien probably sending that to you as we speak. Yeah, we're assigning Dave to do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. Okay, Mr. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Mr. Shaw. Yes, uh, Kevin, Dan Shaw, the supervisor of Easton. I see you've got a lot of work going on in Easton. And you mentioned uh, by the end of the year, is that for everything that you showed on the screen is what your hope is? That's what I we're mean, trying to do. That is absolutely what we're trying to do. We, we brought in additional crews on the make ready side. I will tell you, we have challenges. Uh, as you know, last Friday, Saturday, we had a pretty good thunder and windstorm come through. And so we lost our crews for a couple of days because they're in the Albany area doing storm duty. Um, we lost them for about three weeks back in August when they all headed down south because of the hurricanes. Um, so that is the one uh, element that, I, that we can't control is whenever there's a major storm, everything goes from construction to repair. Um, uh, and my next question is the map that you showed us, is that available that we can get a copy of that? I sent a PDF of that to Dave this morning and, and he can forward that to you. <clears throat> and, and I would say is, is if you want, um, it, it may take me a, uh, a couple of days, but if you send me an email and it's uh, kevin.lynch at slickfiber.com, I'd be glad to, to send you a, a blown up map of your individual township. So it gives you a little more detail. Thank you. Mr. Clare. So. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming today. Um, Kevin, I'm the town supervisor for the town of Salem. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few questions for you. I met with uh, Ray Agnew yesterday. Um, I hear that he's a friend of yours from Paul Smith, maybe. Okay. Yep. Okay, and so he said, sends his regards. Um, and what we're looking for is telehealth, which is really important. Yes. Okay, rural health care uh, accessibility is hopefully going to come through telehealth. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that's one issue. Another issue is uh, the height of the lines. Mm -hmm. We have five places in the town of Salem where they go through fields. Yes. Okay, and so the... Um, Farm vehicles are a height of 18 feet. Okay. And so we don't want you to come through and do all this hard work in the town of Salem and have all the wires snapped during harvesting. Right. Okay. Um, if you had those specific locations, that would be helpful. Typically, we design for 15-6, but I do know our designers are aware when it's to an agricultural field, we try to keep it higher. Um, and in some of those cases, we've chosen to reroute and bury because the okay. cost of putting in 60 foot poles is, is exorbitant. Yeah. Um, not to mention the vehicles getting out into the field. So if you had those specific locations, we, I, I definitely take a look giving update on that. Um, as far as telehealth is concerned, um, you know, I know quite a few of our folks on the network up here use telehealth. I personally use telehealth through our, uh, we part of a nationwide consortium of small telcos. And um, it's a great service to be able to do it because again, in, in Potsdam, we don't always have easy access either. Um, and then if you have specific, it looks like we're coming right through, um, I don't know if it's a village or a hamlet of Salem. Yes. Um, if there's specific locations where you have doctor's offices or things that need access to fiber, you can call those out as well. Um, if we're not there now, we can see what we can do to partner to get those folks connected. Okay, that would be through Glens Falls Hospital and Hudson Headwater. And okay. We're working towards that with the mobile health van. So I'm sure that Ray would love to hear from you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, educationally, one, one more, I'm sorry, uh, one more question. Yes. Educationally, Kevin, we have a Salem School District which reaches out into Hebron, Jackson, and um, you know, it's a, quite an area. It's almost, I think the last count was 168 kids do not have internet access. Okay. Which is proportionally for the size of the school. Um, it's kind of, we're not the, I don't consider us the North country, but <laughs> the Southern part of the County has dramatic needs. Okay. For, yeah, we can look at that. I can also, you know, and I'll just tell you that when these awards went out, unfortunately there's quite a, quite a bit of areas that were awarded to HughesNet. And I know mm -hmm. that's, that, that's not necessarily the, the same solution and um, I won't get myself in trouble and go down that road, <laughs> um, but we'll do what we can. And, and again, one thing is if you'd like, um, I can also on the map, I can overlay the school districts and we can try and identify those places. I'll also tell you that the folks at um, uh, Hudson Valley Wireless, 
have offered, I know in, in the Warren County um, to do some wireless things. And so that might be something we can look at as we bring that fiber infrastructure in, even though I may not be able to do the distribution, that's a nice feed for a wireless. And so those are not necessarily competing technologies. A lot of times they're complementary. Um, so we can try to work together to fill in the gaps. Thank you so much. Mr. Half. Uh, Kevin, my name is Dana Half from the town of Hartford. Uh, you are gonna serve a, a small part of Hartford. You had mentioned the price rates, uh, $60 for 25 up, 25 down. Correct. From what I understand, $60 is the rate that the state um, set to get the, the award for a certain block area of town. You'd also mentioned that you would serve from between point A and point B. If point, if in between point A and point B runs through somebody else's territory, which I think it, it would, mm -hmm. like a HughesNet, yep. you would not provide the service for $60. $60 oh, is right. only in the grant area. No, is that no, no, we, we, we do that. We wouldn't do that. So um, that $60 is what we would charge grant or not grant. The, the only difference between a grant area and a not grant area is in a grant area, the install is a $49 fee. If they're non-grant, it's $149. And we can prorate that over several months if, if that works for the customer. Okay, so the value to the customer is in the installation and the hardware, not the subscription, correct? Yeah, I mean, we could, we, just to be clear, we could charge more in non-grant. We have chosen not to because I don't wanna have a situation where, why is the guy across the street paying 80 and I only have to pay 60 for the same service. I think people understand on the install because part of that install is subsidized as part of the program. Um, but as far as the monthly, that's not really a subsidized part of it. That was just an agreement we had that for the first five years, we would offer a package at that level. Um, that's, that's good because I don't think your other competitors are, are as you know, sympathetic as you are. Also, you would mention um, seniors on SSDI would also get a reduced rate. But social security disability insurance, you could be much younger than a senior. It so it, is, it, it isn't it's, just a senior on that. That's correct. That's correct. So we would also do it for someone who was not a senior who was on SSDI. Well, where we try to make the distinction, and again, you know, we're, we're trying to be helpful, but we have a business. There are seniors, I'll pick on my parents. They get social security. They don't need a discounted rate they're doing fine. So that's why we try to make for, for seniors who are on a fixed income, who are on social security as their main source of income, we try to work with them, but it, it's not necessarily a, uh, like an AR, AARP program, right? It, it's really designed to help low income folks, not just, if, if that makes sense. If I can ask you to clarify a little bit better because there's a difference between social security and social security disability. Right. Which one are you referring to? Social security disability is what we typically refer to if we have seniors and they can demonstrate that they need the discounted rate, we try to work with them. Okay. okay. But, but again, it's not a, it's not a blanket senior discount because it's not really aimed as a senior discount. It, it's aimed as a low income discount. And, you okay. know, a lot of that comes down to the judgment of our customer service reps. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Fedler. So I'm Cassie Fedler, I'm Town of Cambridge, and I didn't hear Cambridge mentioned when you were discussing the town. Um, some of the people saw your reps down in our area and the part of East Cambridge, it runs along Greenwich, Easton Jackson along 372 and towards County Route 74, we're under the impression that Slick Network might be coming through there. Um, what might throw you is, that area is their addresses are Greenwich, even though they're a town of Cambridge. So okay. I was hoping that we are on your map. You so are. are and, and let me just, I can share this again really quick. And then my second question is when you talked about the poles in the middle of the field, if a pole just randomly appears in a field, how do we find out if it's your pole or somebody else's to um, that the so owner's notify the people it needs to be higher right so um so a couple of things one I, I put up the map i hope this shows the area cambridge you're referring to it looks like fly creek uh easton cambridge um it's just to the w west of cambridge there's a little bit to the north it looks like as well 
I guess everybody will tell you I have the worst vision, so I can't see the maps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we do have parts of Cambridge. Um, if the field, well, we wouldn't place a new pole without an easement. So the, the property owner is always contacted either by us, uh, if, it, if it's in um, national grid territory, Slick will actually secure the easement. If it's in NYSEG territory, NYSEG will secure the easement. So any new pole that's placed, there is an easement with the property owner. Um, for existing poles, again, they would design it to go higher. Um, and I know I, I have heard from a few people in, in Cambridge. There was one particular lady. I'm trying to think of the name of the road now. Um, and we chose to reroute it. She was very concerned about that. And we were able to reroute and, and um, it, it was actually cheaper anyway. So. Yeah, we have a no man's land area out here where not even the power lines, nothing crisscrosses. And all of a sudden there's a pole sitting in the middle of the field and there's been quite a few questions about it. And we had no oh, really? idea which company it is. Send me the information on it and I'll, I can look into it. If you can have okay. someone tell me where it is, the closest road, that kind of thing. That seems very odd. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because we're in that, we were grant awarded for the area that we're not going down that road to talk about. <laughs> okay. We're trying to figure out who's coming in to help us. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, let me know those locations. I can definitely help you out. Okay, thank you. So, Kevin, I sent an email containing all the addresses of the email address of the supervisors. <clears throat> I copied all the emails so they'll have your email address so they can ask the specific questions. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Back on the SSI, there we do have um, tax, uh, real estate tax considerations for people with lower incomes. Would that be a guide for you to provide uh, discounts to seniors or disabled people on fixed income? Yes, that would be helpful. We'll see what we can do to get it to you. Okay. But I want to thank you for coming today, Kevin. I know that uh, we've been talking for, what, about four years now? <laughs> it seems, yes. The Indeed. frustration of the program has been substantial, and uh, I thank you for everything you've done, and we hope that the uh, first of January will be turning everyone on. Well, we'll keep pressing hard, and I appreciate all your support on this. I know um, we've reached out to some of the various highway departments, and everyone's really been uh, helpful in, in helping us get things in place. So I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Take care, all. Okay. The next thing we have is a presentation that when I was chairman, I always really liked doing them. It's the retirement ones. Unfortunately, we can't have people come in and get their awards and things now, but I want to run through the list this time. In DPW, we've got two, Peter LeBaron and Lawrence Larry Noland, which I think probably there's going to be a shaking of the earth when Larry retires, I'm not sure. Uh, public Defender, Elan Cheney. Public Health, Patricia Roselle. And in the Sewer District, Joseph Pelkey. So congratulations to all those folks. You've got the condensed minutes in your packet from September 18th, 2020. You, I'll consider them accepted as mail unless there's some additions or corrections. Any additions or corrections? Okay, communications. No communications. Okay. Could we have uh, Tim Hardy and Tim on give us an update of the, where we are on the COVID response right now? Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to try to remote thing here for once. Debbie or Sandy, can you just give me screen share capability so I can throw up the presentation? Yep. All right, so just running through uh, where we are as of now. Um, we're continuing our coronavirus information site daily updates at washingtoncountyny.gov slash coronavirus, uh, which includes the daily updated statistics any new current information on county operations or departments or any changes for the public. Uh, we have the sign up there for the e-newsletter that goes out every day and the important links to the latest up-to-date information from the CDC, Department of Health. Um, just some real updates here uh, as far as public health operations. Public health is back to a seven day a week staffing. Uh, weekend coverage is necessary again and not just the on-call nurse. Obviously the increase in numbers that we've seen lately in public health investigations and positives, active cases, those kind of things that are certainly dictating 
uh, more of their time and having to be here on the weekend that just the on-call nurse just can't handle it all. Um, obviously, you all have seen that we have had some school cases start since school has started. So we're seeing an increase in those cases and investigations with the schools. And I really have to say, I think I speak on behalf of, uh, of our department and public health, the schools are really doing great work. It was a lot of work for them for their planning and everything else. And they are keeping the health and safety of the student staff and the school community as a priority. They're not easy decisions. There's a lot of things that factor into an everyday operation of the school as far as transportation and feeding. And so they're really doing a great job and, uh, and working with us in public health all along the way every time that we have either one of these presumptive positives or an actual positive in the school. Uh, the changes in school guidance have certainly made it very challenging for both the schools and public health. And uh, everybody's just working through that as best that we can. So you may have seen recently from the governor's office that the counties were tasked with creating a COVID-19 rapid testing plan. So we have been working on that. It, it came out last Saturday was the announcement and the request to submit the plan. And we had seven days to do that. Uh, so working with Patty, KJ and, uh, and Chris and Roger um, and the chairman and the vice chairman, we put together a, a quick plan to get things started. Um, which we have no idea as of right now, the hardest part is operational needs are not addressed in any of that. Staffing, logistics, uh, any of those kind of things. There's a lot of things that have to factor into being able to set up our own test site. So we are working through those. And the other part that's the biggest challenge is we have no idea how the amount of supplies uh, are gonna come to us as the county or to other healthcare providers in the county, be it Glens Falls Hospital, Hudson Headwaters, any of the other local doctor's offices. So as soon as we have an idea of what we're looking at getting, we can certainly continue planning for the future, uh, but we are doing that work behind the scenes. As of right now, you know, we're continuing to work with Warren County on the joint testing site and continuing to work with all of our local healthcare providers on referrals for, uh, for testing. You know, there are only a few sites locally that have rapid testing available, and it really is all based on the supply. You know, they could have some today and then they're out until they get some more. So, uh, so those challenges are real challenges that, uh, that we're all dealing with and seeing. The portions of New York pause that still remain in effect uh, regarding the New York forward regulations, those kind of things are the non-essential gatherings, uh, the mask and distancing requirements, which we know, and some of the information that's come down from the state, obviously, is, you know, local governments are being directed to enforce those regulations by the governor uh, in a couple of different, couple of different places and ways. Uh, the county state of emergency is still in effect that was renewed on October 7th. And the executive order from the chairman was last issued on the 27th of September. And for anybody in need, we're continuing to distribute hand sanitizer, uh, especially to our schools, local municipalities, first responders, and uh, local businesses or organizations in need. Anybody in need of that, uh, please reach out to us. And we have uh, plenty of cloth face coverings. Again, if anybody still is in need of those for your town or anybody in your community, please send them our way. We will get them whatever we can. Uh, we're certainly looking to make sure that Anybody who needs a supply of that has access to that. Just a quick run through of the numbers as of yesterday. These are yesterday afternoon's numbers. Usually we do them in the afternoon because we know where the day is going to level out. Uh, 208 are persons under monitoring that are checking in every day with either the contact tracers or our nurses. We're up to 313 confirmed positives in the county. 288 of those have recovered and are off monitoring. We do have one currently in the hospital at this point. Uh, we are at 13 deceased and uh, 2,908 have been released from monitoring since the beginning of this in March. That chart that you see right there is obviously uh, everything since the beginning when we started logging these in March and we followed along. It used to be every Tuesday, Friday, I plotted the points on there. Obviously it's getting bigger and bigger. So I had to just go to every Friday so I could fit everything on, on the map or on the screen for this. Uh, but you can see where we've been since day one with this. Um, the blue are the PUMs or our persons under monitoring, and you can see how that's fluctuated as things change. Obviously, since we've added schools and a couple of other big cases, those numbers are as high or actually they're higher than they've ever been uh, since we started this. So obviously, the, you know, the work on public health is, is pretty significant right now. Our COVID-19 positives, obviously, that number will never go down. So we'll just continue to see that go up. Uh, the one number that has fluctuated a little bit and only in a very small amount, obviously are our hospitalizations in the last couple of weeks, we've had two different people hospitalized at two different times. Uh, and thankfully they've recovered and come out of the hospital. Um, so that's just to give you a look at uh, where we're currently going and just some information for the public on public health investigations and contact tracing. One of the questions that we see come up a lot is how will I know? 
So certainly the public health investigation begins uh, once we know that either there's a presumptive positive or there is an actual positive, they'll gather the contacts in anywhere they've been, and then they start to narrow it down from there uh, based on the information provided will dictate whether or not we have to release public information regarding you know, where the potential positive uh, was and we have to identify people. Most of the time, people are very forthcoming with the information and it makes it, uh, you know, I don't wanna say easy, but it makes it easier for our public health staff to work through that investigation. So the biggest thing that we can tell the public is please, please, please be honest uh, when you hear from the contact tracers or our nurses and please make sure you answer the phone. Obviously, a lot of this is done by phone so those are the two calls you'll see. It's either gonna come from our own Washington County Public Health, which you'll see that 518-746-2400 number, or you'll see it come up as the New York State contact tracing. And uh, obviously the information that you provide uh, certainly helps the investigation go in the right way and make sure that uh, you know, everybody we're monitoring is, is taking care of themselves or you know, is in need of uh, assistance. And I think uh, the last thing is just the reminders that we keep sending out, you know, stay home if you're not feeling well, please don't subject anybody else, whether it's COVID, the flu or anything else. Be mindful of your activities and those you visit. Certainly, if you become, uh, you know, part of a contact tracing event, that's going to be important. The contact tracers or the nurses are going to ask you those questions. Uh, make sure you keep your distance at least six feet from others. Avoid gatherings. Uh, I know it's getting tough. We all want to be hanging out with each other, uh, but certainly that we are still seeing spread in those gatherings of any type, even smaller ones. Uh, wash your hands often and mask up when you're out in public places where you can't distance. The other point of mention is we are seeing household spread, like significant household spread. As of some of the last positives that have come out, we've had three separate uh, families or households that have had at least two or three positives in the house at the same time. Early on in this, we weren't seeing that. We were seeing one positive and the other two uh, didn't test positive out of it or didn't so, uh, show symptoms. So we're starting to see that as well. So uh, if you have any questions, I will try to answer what I can. Mr. Hicks. Yeah, Tim, I'm not sure you can help with uh, this or not, but uh, for some of our Eastern towns, uh, we seem to be in a yo-yo going from green to yellow from Vermont to green to yellow to green to yellow. And um, it appears that the information we get from you We've been relatively consistent between 12 and 17 positives, but when it goes from, you know, 12 on Friday to 17 on Tuesday, it looks like Vermont looks like a 30% increase, so they throw us into yellow, but then last Tuesday we were at 17, we're at 12 today, we're going to get a 30% decrease. Um, do you understand how their metrics work and how we can kind of manage this? Because, you know, some days we can go in and some days we can't, and the next day we can. Any idea how that's all working over there? I certainly understand the frustration and we get a lot of those calls. Uh, I'm going to call on my lifeline and send this one over to Chris. I know Chris has addressed this uh, with with Bob and the chairman on some of the control room calls is I think we're all struggling to, to get that same understanding. Yeah, I mean, the, the short answer, Mr. Hicks, is that no, we can't control them on. Um, but when it first happened, we were able to flag it as a control room. We had executive staff talk to gubernatorial staff over in Vermont, and we thought we had basically what you're saying about percentages is exactly right. Our low numbers are counting against us in this case with the way their formula works. Not only is it just a percentage of change, but then they weight the recentness of the positive. So when we go from 12 to 17, it's a 30% increase, and those cases are weighted with a multiplier, so it actually looks like a 120% increase. Um, if we report it every day and it went up one a day for a couple of days, then it wouldn't trigger it. Well, so we report every day. Okay. What happens is they only calculate it on Tuesdays. So they're looking at a seven day change. And if our numbers just hit in the wrong sign curve with where they're measuring it, it looks like a massive percentage increase, but our numbers are so small, the actual number of cases isn't that big. Uh, there seems to be no indication from our uh, Green Mountain friends that they are willing to change their formula. Um, and so I think at this point, and I know it must be very frustrating for all of our border communities, and it is what it is, unfortunately. They're not willing to change. Um, I don't particularly think that their algorithm is all that um, valuable when you're dealing with numbers like we are, uh, but they seem to um, have faith in the algorithm and want to stick with it. Uh, Mr. Hass. Tim, the one graph that you put up showed it was a chart. 
and it had different colored representations. And I was looking at the whatever was denoted in the red. It continues upward and upward and upward. I think, and I'm asking you, are you mixing cumulative statistics on a graph that you also have up and down spikes? Because when you look at it, it looks like that problem is increasing, increasing, but there may be out of the 222 or whatever the number is, most of those are clear. It's a confusing chart to look at because I think you are mixing different overlay, overlays. So uh, Mr. Half, the actual, the red dots were our total number of positives we've had since day one. So that's the number that just never will go down. I mean, even if you look at the daily reports, on the website or that go out, that number obviously will never go down. It just can't. Uh, so that's the total number of positives. The other ones are the numbers that fluctuate. The other ones are the, the persons under monitoring, which you see go up and down on a daily basis, depending on what kind of cases they're doing. I mean, uh, what, what you see significantly with those is like some of these school cases, it's nothing to see 20 or 30 people become part of a school investigation. And that's just one student. So if you have a couple of different classrooms, you know, you see upwards of 40 or 50. But yes, uh, so in, in terms of your question, that number just won't go down. Uh, I think that one's the only one that's kind of like the standout color, just so people understand that it is just gonna keep going up. I mean, there's no way to change that. But it, it, my point is it might not be appropriate to have that on that chart because when people look at charts, they don't spend half an hour analyzing what the chart means. It's a visual representation. People see a visual, they make an opinion very quickly, that, oh my God, it's getting worse and worse and worse when that is a cumulative statistic overlaid on other statistics as to where we are today. And I just think it's rather confusing and the appearance of it, I think makes it look worse than it is. Maybe that number should be a footnote somewhere or a separate chart, but I think when you overlay a cumulative statistic on a daily statistic of where we are today, so, okay, I, I certainly understand what you mean. Uh, perhaps that maybe for the, the next one, what I'll do is do a, uh, a current status chart and then do a history. This one is really meant to be a history so you can see how everything has gone since day one. So I, I think I understand your concern. So I can certainly do one of the bar graphs that was there was more like a, it included where we were as the numbers as of uh, yesterday, for example. So because I can do a red line. It only shows the active positives to your concern. That, that red line gives an impression that it's getting worse every report when it's a cumulative number. Yeah, I think I understand what you're asking for. Okay, so we got Mr. Griffin to, to that. Uh, and, and Danny, you're correct. But there's three points on there that are cumulative. So the, the, the person's under, under monitoring, that's the variable line in there. The other three are also, the other two are also cumulative hospitalizations and deaths. So I agree with Dana, maybe you should take the person's under monitoring out as its own separate graph. And you can still leave the other ones in there, even if you do it as a cumulative or if you do it as a bar graph. Yes. Understood. Anybody else? Supervisor Clary. Tim, again, I want to thank you and your crew and, and Patty Hunt going to seven days a week is, is, a, is a big deal. And um, I agree with Matt Hicks regarding Vermont. The phone calls I'm getting are driving me crazy because, you know, what Vermont State has their yellow county and New York State has their yellow county, which gets people very confused. And then you have your big um, road sign on 153 that is telling everybody what they can do and what they can't do. And, and so how you're keeping track of all this is incredible. And I thank you. Um, if you wanna take over the town of Salem with the Vermont line, um, I could put you on speed dial. <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> We're all set. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Tim. Uh, as the uh, committee reports on it. Report to the auditing committee. Resolved that the report to the auditing committee dated October 14, 2020, totaling $3,650,084.75, be in the same hereby as in all respects, accepted, approved, and adopted. 
be a further resolved that the county treasurer be in a year by his authorized and directed to pay the several amounts set forth in said report in the total of two million five hundred forty nine thousand one dollar and thirty six cents and be a further resolved that the attached is a separate report in the total of one million fifty two thousand sixty dollars and sixty seven cents from the county auditor for the period of September sixteenth through October thirteenth, two thousand and twenty. Vice Chairman, I'd like to move that the uh, committee accept this report. Move by Supervisor Losa, second. O'Brien, Cleary. Discussion. All those in favor? Uh, right. Go over the show of hands, you guys at home. <laughs> All those opposed? Carried. The next order of business is the introduction of Local Law D of 2020. We'll have the clerk read the title. County of Washington, New York, Introductory Local ID of 2020 by Supervisors Campbell O'Brien, Hicks, Feather, Skelly, Clary, Rosell, Losal, Ward, Griffith, a local law in relation to the administration of the Washington County Workers' Compensation Self-Insurance Plan and superseding previous local laws concerning the same. Thank you. Introduction of resolutions. Um, Supervisor, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I didn't see anybody in the background. Sitting with you for supervisor's privilege. Anybody have anybody hiding in the back that they want to give privilege? Seeing none. Introduction resolutions. And we do not need to set aside the rules or have you read the resolves or anything, right? That's right. Resolution number 228 by Supervisor George Hogan, Ask, Hicks, O'Brien, Clary, title to make appointments to the Washington County EMS Advisory Board. Mr. Chairman, moving resolution 228 forward. Moved by Supervisor Ward. Second. Uh, Clary. Losa. Fedler. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 229 by Supervisor Skelly, Roselle, Campbell, Half, Hicks, Feather, Wilson, title authorizing agreement between the County of Washington and the County of Warren for the removal of snow and salting sanding to control ice on page Warren County roads for 2021. Chairman, moving resolution number 229. Move by Supervisor Skelly, second. Second. Campbell, Feather, Ward. Discussion. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson seconding? Seconding. Seconding. Uh, discussion. Mr. Half. Every year I bring this up, so expect to hear it again next year. Washington County does not apply any sand to the roads. If I were Warren County and I saw that they're going to be chill, charged $376 to sweep sand that we did not put down, I would object. I think the wording should be changed to sweep, pick up, and removal of debris or something, but we do not apply sand, what we're charging to sweep sand. I think the county does actually sweep the road, but not for sand. They just sweep it for whatever debris is left over from the winter. But if I had a contractor come to my house and charge me for something they did not do, I would dispute that. Now, I know they say, oh, we do this every year. Nobody looks at it. Nobody cares. But, you know, words matter. And I, I think it'd be very easy to change it. I think one year we did change it. But then the next year, the default was they probably went back to the resolution they did the year before, not paying attention to the amendment that changed it. And here we have it again and again and again. But $554 per mile to sweep, pick up, removal of road sand that we do not apply. So nothing will happen. I'll be back next year. Thank you. For the comment. All those in favor? Uh, I oppose. Seeing none, carried. Resolution number 230 by Supervisors Fedler, Campbell, Hicks, Skelly, Griffiths, Title. Set time and place for a public hearing on parcels requesting inclusion in certified agricultural districts. Mr. Chairman, moving resolution number 230. Move by Supervisor Fedler, second. Campbell. Griffiths, Ward, Skelly, discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Carried. Bless you. Resolution number 
one by Supervisor Keller, <laughs> Hicks, Skelly, Griffith, titled To Establish Lead Agency for Seeker Review and Set Time and Place for a Public Hearing on Washington County Consolidated Agricultural District Number 5. Moving resolution number 231. Move with Supervisor Fedler. Second. Campbell. Griffith. Skelly. Second. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 232 by Supervisor Fedler, Campbell, Hicks, Skelly, Griffiths, title to appoint members to the Workforce Development Board. Moving resolution number 232. Move by Supervisor Fedler, second. Campbell, Griffiths, Losaw, Shaw. Discussion. Mr. Hass. Are these positions compensated? Thank you. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 233 by Supervisor Tex Ward O'Brien Clary, Title Amend Staffing Pattern, Department of Social Services. Move to 233. Move by Supervisor Hicks. Second. Uh, Campbell, Clary, Fedler, Ward, O'Brien. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 234 by Supervisor Campbell. Title, amend the title by grade schedule to add bookkeeper at 40 hours a week. Moving resolution 234. Moved by Supervisor Campbell. Second. Ward, Fedler, Clary. Discussion. This is a roll call. Mr. Hankey. Yes. Mrs. Fedler. Yes. I can't see my screen. Oh, sorry. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Mr. Hall. Yes. Mr. Lothoff? Yes. Mr. Hicks? Yes. Mr. Ward? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Half? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Skelly? Yes. Mr. Hogan? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mrs. Clary? Yes. Mr. Griffith? Yes. Mr. Rosell? Where did he go? We might have lost him. I don't see him on the screen. Flex working on his phone line. Okay, let's, let's call him absent for right now. Okay. The resolution is adopted 3,918 yes, 342 absent. Resolution number 235 by Supervisor Tax Ward O'Brien Clary, Title Amendment Passing Pattern, Public. Moving to 235. Move to Supervisor Hicks, second. O'Brien, Losaw, Campbell, Clary, Ward, Fedler. Discussion. Mr. Half. This does not make a little sense, does not make much sense to me, but I'd like some explanation. So you want to replace a nurse with a specific title with a registered nurse, but is that registered nurse going to be doing emergency preparedness infection control? Is it, I don't quite understand this. So the issue becomes that we cannot recruit at the uh, emergency preparedness slash infectious control nurse title. We have been unable to successfully recruit for that title for several years. Uh, so it would be ideal to be able to get somebody in that title, but without being able to, it would be more beneficial to the department to have a registered nurse that could help with some of the other duties. Uh, there may be some overlap in the registered nurse that they're able to hire will be taking some of the duties, but they will not be able to assume them all. How will all those duties be performed? They, they will still be performed by more than one person? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 
Hicks by Supervisors Campbell, O'Brien, Hicks, Feather, Skelly, Clary, Rodell, Losell, Ward, Griffith, Title, Amend Sewer District No. 2 Budget for Cedar Street Project. Moving resolution number 236. Move by Supervisor Campbell. Second. Osa, O'Brien, Clary, Griffith, Ward, Skelly, Fedler, and Wolf. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 237 by Supervisors Campbell, O'Brien, Hicks, Fedler, Skelly, Clary, Roselle, Losell, Ward, Griffiths, Title, Amend Sewer District 2 Budget for Rogers Street Emergency Repairs. Moving resolution number 237. Move by Supervisor Campbell. Second. O'Brien, Losa, Clary, Griffith, Ward, Fedler, and Wilson. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Gary. Resolution number 238 by Supervisor Campbell, O'Brien, Hicks, Fedler, Skelly, Clary, Roselle, Lowell, Ward, Griffiths, Title, Amend Budget, County Road Fund for Insurance Recovery. Moving resolution 238. Moved by Supervisor Campbell. Second. Losa, Clary, Griffith, Ward, Skelly, Fedler. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 239 by Supervisors Campbell, O'Brien, Hicks, Feather, Skelly, Clary, Rochelle, Rochelle, Ward, Griffiths, Title, Amend Budget, Capital Project Number 113, Homeland Security Grants for Fiscal Year 2020 Award. Moving resolution number 239. Move by Supervisor Campbell. Second. Rosa, Clary, Griffiths, Ward, Fedler. And Wilson. Discussion. What does LETPP mean? Is that Law Enforcement Terrorism Prevention Plan? I think it's Law Enforcement Terrorism Preparedness and Prevention Plan. Okay, I think sometimes when we have acronyms on here, maybe it could be in the text where you know it says what it is with the abbreviation because. I don't, I'm sure I'm not the only one that doesn't know what those things mean. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 240 by Supervisors Campbell, O'Brien, Hicks, Fedler, Skelly, Clary, Roselle, Losell, Ward, Griffiths, Title to Amend 2020 OFA Budget to Recognize COVID-19 ADRC Stimulus Funds. Moving resolution 240. Moved by Supervisor Campbell. Second. O'Brien, Losell, Clary, Griffiths, Fedler, and Ward. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 241 by Supervisors Campbell, O'Brien, Hicks, Feather, Skelly, Clary, Roselle, Rosal, Ward, Griffiths, Title to Amend 2020 Board of Elections Budget to cover additional postage expenses. Moving resolution 241. Moved by Supervisor Campbell. Second. Losa, O'Brien. Clary, Griffith, Ward, Fedler, Wilson. Discussion. Unfunded mandate. Further discussion? Bless you. <laughs> well, is that true if you look at the budget? No, we expect there to be additional funding. We just haven't received it yet. Right. At the moment, it's the moment. Right. At the moment, you're holding your breath. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 242 by Supervisors Campbell, O'Brien, Hicks, Fedler, Skelly, Clary, Roselle, Losal, Ward, Griffiths, Title to Set Date of Annual Meetings. Moving resolution 242. Moved by Supervisor Campbell. Second. O'Brien, Clary, Griffiths, Fedler, and Ward. Discussion. We should not be allowed to conduct business during hunting season. Further discussion. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 243 by Supervisors Campbell, O'Brien, Hicks, Feather, Skelly, Clary, Roselle, Losal, Ward, Griffiths, titled Determine Time and Place for a Public Hearing on the 2021 Tentative Budget. Move to resolution number 243. Move by Supervisor Campbell. Second. O'Brien, Losa, Clary, Griffith, Ward, Edler. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Opposed? Carried. Resolution number 244 by Supervisors Campbell, O'Brien, Hicks, Feather, Skelly, Clary, Roselle, Losal, Ward, Griffith, Title, the steps. Public hearing on introductory local law D of 2020, a local law in relation to the administration of the Washington County Workers' Compensation Self Insurance Plan, and superseding previous local laws concerning the same. Public resolution 244. Move by Supervisor Campbell. Second. Losa, Griffith, Ward, Fedler. Discussion. Mr. Shaw. Yeah, um, Chris, could you explain the significant changes in this from the original plan? Uh, so what this local law would do is to amend uh, the existing local law that establishes the catastrophic reserve within the workers' comp fund. Um, after some discussion with the budget officer and the treasurer, uh, the feeling was that the current catastrophic reserve is really uh, maybe a little bit stronger than it needs to be. So what we discussed in finance was uh, lowering the catastrophic reserve number um, and perhaps uh, establishing a new reserve, not uh, controlled by local law, but rather controlled by resolution within the fund that would be a large claim reserve so that we could pay out large claims from that less restrictive reserve uh, to protect the operating fund balance within the fund. I guess the idea is to work to replenish itself every two years so that the money's always available mm -hmm. and more after. So that we don't get the peaks and valleys and all that, so that we don't see big changes like we see right now in the workers count fund. You know, on the town level, town level. Further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Period. Okay. Supervisor's comment. Uh, Chairman, I just wanted to uh, I want to say thank you to the Backhoe Conservancy and a couple of local residents. Uh, uh, there was a they did a river cleanup on September 26th. They started. Uh, there's two locations they started off from: the Route 13 uh, pull off to Eagleville Bridge, and then the other group went from the Georgie to the Route 22 pull off. We got about three bags of garbage, and they did clean up around the uh, around the pool as well. So, just wanted to thank those uh, those volunteers for that built and services. Very nice, thank you. Well, Mr. Clary, um, I want to thank the Washington County uh, Police Department for putting up one of those uh, speed signs outside the school uh, during the the hybrid uh, transport. You know, the hybrid education and transportation and the construction going on at the school on East Broadway. It got pretty complicated and they put one of the signs up and, you know, fortunately my phone was ringing saying thank you. And I, I really appreciated people calling and I appreciate the Washington County Sheriff's put it, for putting the sign on 153. It was a great help. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hogan, do you have your hand up? Hey, Mr. Campbell. Yeah, so the tentative budget, I'm open to release on the 28th. Do we have a meeting in the morning? I don't think we've set a time yet for sure whether we want to do it immediately after that meeting or if we want to do it in the afternoon. Uh, but be aware that today we're looking at 28. Okay. Anybody else? All right, I just want to say a quick thank you to our personnel and staff and this agency, uh, particularly the public health. Uh, they're still out straight. Uh, we had something come up here. Oh, it was on Chris on Tuesday, I think. The governor presented something that you know, testing equipment and stuff could come to the counties. However, you had to 
create a plan and all manner of documentation and things, which had to be done by this morning. They, uh, they you know, between Chris and Tim and, and Patty, they rose to the occasion, got it done, and did a pretty adequate job. I just, we, a lot of times don't see that stuff that happens and makes it pretty seamless. But boy, there's an awful lot of thrashing under the water here, and I really appreciate you guys doing it, and stepping up, and, and you know, making the effort. Anybody else? Okay. We are adjourned at 11.11. .11.